So what I'd like to do now is just to give a brief outline of the Waldorf geometry curriculum. So here it is, very briefly, Waldorf geometry curriculum. Let me ask the question, when does it start? Kindergarten. kindergarten. You could absolutely argue for kindergarten, I'm sure, in many ways. Um, I would say in terms, of, in terms of when it becomes conscious, there are many things they would be doing in kindergarten that wouldn't be done consciously for the child. But when it absolutely begins is on the first day of first grade. Now, who knows what the first day of first grade is in any world? It's, it's kind of one of those um, very interesting things about a Waldorf school. You have this idea on the first day of school all over the world, all of these children in Waldorf schools are having the exact same lesson. It's true. It's true. And it's the, do you know what it is? The curved and the straight line. It's a curved line and the straight line. And typically the first homework assignment is they go home and they find everything in their world that's curved and everything that's straight, and then they talk about that. It's a very wonderful lesson that the first graders really live into quite real. There it is, the first day of geometry right there, the curved and the straight line. Uh, it's interesting. I do a, uh, an introduction to trigonometry in 10th grade, and Mr. Hilliard will be doing that this year, and it starts with the curved and the straight line in trigonometry as well. So you can go back to that. So here we are. Um, the Waldorf geometry curriculum, I would first point out um, grades one through four Grades one through four, what are they doing that involves geometry? Any ideas? That's called form drawing, what I just suggested with the curved and the straight line. And of course, out of that comes the children learning how to write the letters. You know, they're learning that out of writing actually comes out of that. So we have form drawing and I'd say the other aspect of geometry is through movement, but through eurythmy. We make it more conscious is really grades five through seven, what I was just speaking of and what we have been doing in our short time together this evening is geometric drawing and constructions. Geometric drawing, the limason, and very many other things. It's the, it's the pretty pictures that they come home with, and they're wonderful. They love to shade them in. It's all about being precise and careful. In sixth grade in particular, that's when for the first time that they're given a compass and a straight edge. And it's really a special thing for them. Often it's right at the beginning of the sixth grade year. Geometric drawing and constructions is more what I just did. And, oh, we've got a compass and a straight edge. It's not so much about the pretty pictures, but solving these puzzles. How can we take an angle and bisect it? How can we find, as we just did, the center of a circle? Again, maybe not till 10th grade. Many other, how can we draw a parallel line instead of a perpendicular line? All these sort of basic constructions. In seventh grade is really the beginning Grade seven is the beginning of proofs. Very beginning. Usually visual imaginative proofs. We saw this showing how the angles inside of a triangle add to 180. I showed you a second proof of that with the movement proof as a line came up from the bottom. I'm going to show you another one in a little bit. Um, eighth grade. It's my favorite year for geometry. And I don't think it's accidental because eighth grade, for those of you who have had a child in eighth grade or, like myself, have a child in eighth grade, it's quite a time of change, isn't it? It's a very dramatic time. And as the child is going through these tremendous inward uh, upheaval, transformation, all of these things, all the emotional roller coaster, all of it that comes with this, we really study what I would call the geometry of transformation. 
This is a term that I talk about. And we do this in particular in two dimensions through what is called loci. And loci being really, um, I'll just say curves of various sorts. And then we have three dimensional, which is what I call stereometry. I didn't invent the term, it's really the term that the ancient Greeks used, the study of three dimensional form. This includes, so this is solids, the study of solids here. Um, this includes what we know as the platonic solids. I would like you to show you some of these. It's very well known in Waldorf schools. Most every Waldorf school, the students will experience these special platonic solids. Um, it's sort of a hobby of mine. I'll show you some of this in a little bit here uh, where we go a little bit further with that and they're making all kinds of different forms and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful main lesson together. So eighth grade is really a key point, I think, in the Waldorf geometry curriculum. Grade nine. is descriptive geometry. Descriptive geometry. Um, sometimes this could be called mechanical drawing. It used to be a course that anybody who was an engineer or an architect would have to take. Uh, nowadays it's a little bit different because we do many of these things, of course, with the computer through AutoCAD and various other programs. But descriptive geometry, how can we draw something exactly it's a wonderful course. How can we take a building, for instance, as an architect and draw the top view, the side view, the front view? How can we take instead uh, a form that perhaps we, a platonic solid that we made out of clay and paper in eighth grade, how can we actually draw it with great precision and rotate it to look in a certain way? That's a wonderful exercise as well. Grade 10. Grade 10 is then Euclidean proofs. I know for many of us that went, in, uh, that went to a public school or another mainstream independent school, we may have, you may be remembering, oh, 10th grade geometry was proofs. And that's what we do here also. It's not the whole year actually, but it is a deep experience of logical proofs. It's a wonderful thing. I would consider it really to be a rite of passage of sorts. Um, and we actually, in this school, we go back and look at Euclid. We look at the original text of how did Euclid do this, and it really builds up to his proof of the Pythagorean theorem. It's a wonderful journey for, I think, the students to go through. And then in many ways, the culmination are the most famous, well-known thing in Waldorf schools is something called projective geometry. I would like to give you a little bit of taste of this. What is grade nine descriptive geometry? Descriptive geometry is also what we're calling mechanical drawing. So drawing, drawing a three-dimensional object really exactly. You don't have to be an artist to do it, but really with great care and precision to draw, a two -dimension, draw on two-dimensional paper a three-dimensional form. Um, I think there's one thing I did forget here, and that's up here in eighth grade. Um, we're also doing volumes. What is often termed, and only in Waldorf schools I've seen this term, is mensuration. Um, the eighth grade girls and boys all giggle, um, <laughs> but at any rate, yeah, that's what the term is, um, the study of volumes. And so this is, again, I, I'm really especially emphasizing in many ways the things that make Waldorf geometry actually quite unique. And so this really gives uh, a very brief overview of all the different things that we can do in a Waldorf school um, regarding geometry. It's quite exciting. So in eighth grade we have as part of the geometry, tra geometry of transformation main lesson that I have, um, I pose this treasure problem. Uh, and so it could go something like this. You've discovered instructions for the treasure and we would build up to the following question over a couple of days, but actually maybe by the second day already we would be there. And imagine that the instructions say 
that this treasure is buried equally far from a really long fence, straight fence. You can imagine it as an infinitely long straight line. It's equally far, it's buried equally far from this really long fence and a tree. Equally far from this fence and a tree. Let me um, do this here. So the puzzle we've been given is this treasure is buried equally far from a fence. Here's my fence and a tree. This is a bird's eye view of my tree that has no branches. Where is it that this treasure could possibly be located? And of course, what every student immediately thinks, you, know, you can imagine the student getting out there very excited to find the treasure. Oh, often thought we should do it for real. They get out there with a shovel and immediately they start digging right here. And they are very disappointed to find that it's not there. Well, where else could it be? So I'll leave you with this puzzle. If you can just do a rough sketch, kind of as I did here. Where are all the possible places? This is the question for you. Where are all the possible places that you could dig in order to find the treasure such that it is halfway, or not, not halfway, equally far? <laughs> to be very careful, the treasure is equally far from the tree and the fence, this was the halfway point, which it wasn't there. So where are all the possible places it could be? So I'll give you a couple minutes to think of that. All right, I'll give you a little bit of a, a clue, shall I? Yes, yes. Good idea. Here's my little bit of a clue. Um, oftentimes people will then think, wait a minute, I, I could be more than just there. I could also be out, how about about that far? And then it's here. The, the trick is, where, where many people fall into a trap is they kind of get out their compass and do various things. Here's what you need to remember. If I'm standing here, what, how do I measure the distance to the line? It has to be, ultimately, and we don't need this, but it's at a right angle, isn't it? Yeah? If, I, if somebody asks me, how far am I standing right now from Broadway? I'm going to measure that distance by, in this case, walking directly east, perpendicular to Broadway. If I'm going to measure the distance of Broadway, I'm not going to walk in this direction. You know, it could be like two miles before I hit it or something. It's the, shortest distance. it's the shortest distance, which is going to be at a right angle. And of course, so this point looks about right if I'm just doing a rough sketch. And in a minute, we're going to do it exactly. And then I have it here as well, roundabout. And it kind of makes sense doesn't it? That there ought to be all other points around here. Well, it's not a straight line because if I drew a straight line, do you, can you tell that if I were right there, I'd be closer to the tree than I am the fence? Yeah, it's down, well, maybe right about there. That looks about right. And so I start to get this idea of there being a curve. And of course, it doesn't stop there, does it? And then people will often think, well, it looks like part of a circle. But it couldn't be a circle because if I'm up here, for instance, then I'm closer to the tree than the fence. So it can never go over the top of the circle, really, can it? So let's just, just look at it and eyeball it. Yeah, what, what do you think? Right about there? About equally far from both, let's say. Again, I'm, I'm measuring this distance with my eye equal to that distance here. Yeah, the distance to the line is equal to the distance of the circle. And so as I do this, I can see this general shape. And that's just a rough sketch. 